My pleasure today then to introduce uh, Sir John Daniel. Uh, he has a very distinguished career in online distance and uh, uh, open education. I won't go through his really extensive uh, vitae, but just to say most recently he was the uh, president of the Commonwealth of Learning from 2004 to 2012. And also recently he published a book, uh, Mega Schools, Technology and Teachers, Achieving Education for All, published by Routledge, 2010. Uh, he's the recipient of many, many honours, and most recently uh, a local honour, or at least a national local one. He is now a member, an officer of the Order of Canada, 2013, for which we, of course, congratulate him. John is here today uh, in Chet to talk about MOOCs. Um, as you know, I'm sure many of you, this is the acronym for, I'll read it out, Massive Open Online Courses, and they are becoming both topical and, and widespread in, in higher education. So, so John, let, let me uh, ask you to uh, explain how you got interested in these courses, the origin of your interest, and how it's developed in recent years. Certainly. Well, uh, first of all, I've been involved in open and distance learning now for 40 years, actually. Um, in 2012, I spent a month as a visiting fellow in Korea, mm -hmm. and they wanted a research paper. And in fact, it was a friend who said, look, everyone's talking about these MOOCs. Why don't you write it on that? Mm -hmm. so, so I did. Um, and I was very lucky in a way because the timing of the paper at the end of September 12 was about the first synthesis that anyone had tried to do on this MOOCs phenomenon. Um, and so it went all over the place and I'm still getting invited to talk about them because of that. And I'm trying to keep a bit up to date. But MOOCs themselves, uh, interestingly the term MOOC originated in Canada in 2008 for a course at the University of Manitoba called Connectivism and Connective Knowledge, very much in the Paolo Freire theory of education, connecting people and all this kind of thing. But no one took much notice until 2012 when the, some elite American universities, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, jumped in with some things called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, but which were very different in that they were much more instructional and much more behaviorist, old-fashioned pedagogy, you know, you, we will teach you and you will note it down sort of thing. Um, but because the, these were elite universities suddenly offering courses on a massive scale, um, it caught the imagination of the news media. So this became a nine days wonder, in fact a nine months wonder, and there was feverish talk about there's a revolution in higher education on the way and so on and so forth. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, MOOCs, uh, there's good news and bad news. I mean, the, the, the bad news is that, as far as I'm concerned, they're not really higher education. Because they're certainly massive. I mean, the, the first MIT course reached 150,000 students worldwide. Uh, they're open in that they're free of charge. Anyone can take them if they've got an internet connection. Um, so people did in 160 countries. They're obviously online. If you're not online, you can't do anything with them. Um, whether they're a course or not, I would rather argue with, because as, as far as I'm concerned, higher education is not just teaching and learning. It's teaching and learning leading to assessment and credentialing. And there is effectively no credentialing in, in, in the MOOCs. So to me, they're a kind of update of the kind of extramural studies that went on in the old British universities in the sort of 19th, 20th century where people would go out to the villages and give lectures and so on and it was all fine uh, and good but it wasn't really higher education in the, in the proper sense. So if you like um, I think they've been overhyped as such but what I think MOOCs have done is to really accelerate a process of change. It got the attention of higher education and particularly the senior administrators in higher education like few things have done before. Mm -hmm. So universities that were playing around with a bit of online and you know what's this mean and so on suddenly decided they had to actually think about this much more seriously. So as far as I'm concerned it's much more the the follow-up to MOOCs 
which will be important. And already MOOCs are diversifying hugely. I'm told, I learned yesterday, there's something like 1,100 MOOCs out there. And they're diversifying by subject, by person offering them. Um, some joker remarked that every, every letter in the acronym MOOC is now negotiable, you know, massive. Now it doesn't mean 100,000, it can mean 100. Open, what does it exactly mean? Is it free, is it not free? Is it an open educational resource? All these things. So, but that's good because, as I shall say in my talk here, I think one of the big challenges for higher education is the massive underemployment, unemployment of young people who are neither in employment nor education nor training and maybe the sequel to MOOCs if the subjects diversify and if there is credible credentialing could be a partial answer to that issue. Secondly I think it is certainly hastening the move online of uh, universities and colleges generally. I mean, I learned again yesterday that uh, last year 500,000 students in Ontario alone took courses online. And this is significant numbers for, for one province. So it's doing that. But it's also shaking things up in other ways. I think the experience not just of MOOCs but of online courses generally shows that shorter courses go over better than longer courses. And by short, I mean five to six weeks. So there's a tendency now for online courses to become shorter, which in the third consequence is having a knock-on effect on, on credentialing and qualifications. Um, there's a sort of growing feeling that the standard degree is too long and so alternatives are emerging, um, one of which I shall mention is open badges. This is a sort of whole new approach to credentialing that started in the software industry but seems to be spreading out. So that, that sort of in, in, a, in, a, in a rather long summary is where I think, uh, where I think MOOCs are taking us. Mm -hmm. The term in, in your talk, you're going to talk about post-traditional education, is that what you've just summarised? It perhaps well, in a way, yes. I think it, it's a term actually that was coined by my colleague um, Stamenka Uvalich Trumbich, who is a co-author of my paper today, yes. who worked, who was the head of higher education at UNESCO for many years. We don't think it's a perfect term, but it's better than any of the others we've heard. And what we're describing are a, a, a conjuries of new approaches which have as a common factor openness open educational resources, MOOCs, open badges, open educational practice, a whole range of mm -hmm. things which are sort of different, but which, and, and the reason we're doing this is because even though this is, if you like, post-traditional and is also often outside the standard qualifications frameworks, there's a general feeling that there should be some sort of form of quality assurance for this anyway. So we're in the process of preparing a guide to quality in post-traditional online higher education, which is going to try to grapple with how you put quality into phenomena which are by their very nature meant to be more open. Mm -hmm. And it's all straightforward because, I mean, people, there's been a terrific lather in Europe about quality assurance of open educational resources. Well, I say to them, listen, the whole point of an open educational resource is that you can adapt it, mix it, change it. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to do a quality assurance on a product which is an open educational resource, the moment you let it out of the door, it will become something different. So, you know, where is the quality gone? So the quality assurance has to be, in my, in my sense, much more in the processes and in the solidity of the framework in which it's done. So that if it's done within this framework, chances are it'll be okay to start with and then what happens afterwards is, is anyone's guess. In, in a similar way, um, so far I think it's true to say that, uh, that there hasn't been much in the way of quality assurance of MOOCs, certainly not at the outside the institutions. I'm sure institutions that do them try and make sure that they're ready to put their name on them. But um, it's uh, that too is, is, is slightly tricky. So what's happened so far, I think, is that the university brand is what stands for the quality. So people assume it's from Harvard, therefore it must be good. Now, to my mind, this is not necessarily a 
a good assumption because while Harvard is a very good research university, there's nothing says that their online teaching will be any better than anyone else's and maybe worse. And some of the early MOOCs were pretty pedestrian. But of course, as more and more people jump in, it's getting more and more competitive. And that exacerbates another problem, which is that MOOCs are free. So as yet, there is no business model. And yet, universities are falling over themselves to do them. And in order to be better than the last guy, they're spending more money. So whereas in the early days, people would say twenty to $50,000 will do you a nice MOOC, now we're hearing two hundred, two hundred and fifty thousand. dollars Well, that's a lot of money to spend if you're not getting any return on it. So it's full of wonderful paradoxes and interesting, interesting sort of sidelines. Your last comment leads me to, to, to the, the next question. And uh, obviously, open, it's open to all. There's no uh, prerequisite. It's global. Mm -hmm. Of course, the online internet, all of the all of the things we know, make that possible. But the key, I think, is the no, the, the idea that it's free. Yeah. Um, any indications yet uh, of some of the leading institutions transforming? I mean, creating a new business model where uh, it begins as free, but then becomes a, a profit making venture. Yes, I mean, everyone's been feverishly trying to do that. Um, so, for instance, if you want a certificate of completion, you go to a local study centre and you pay to be invigilated as you take the test. The big problem with all that is that the people who make money are not the originating university, but companies around the edges who are providing these, these services. Um, I'm sure that if they started to charge uh, fees for the MOOC, uh, forgetting the quite interesting problem of collecting money in 160 countries, uh, I'm sure the demand would go down dramatically, even if the price were only $10. But, of course, I mean, what it's really doing is um, driving people to do more courses online, but to also try and cut costs. That The one that everyone talks about is a master's in information technology from Georgia Tech, I think, where the price for the whole master's degree is $7,000, which is probably you know, about a fifth of what it would be if you did it uh, over the counter, as it were. And, and this is part of something which I will touch on here, but not explore in detail, which is, if you like, the, the terrific pressures that the US system is under with the popping of the tuition fees bubble that has been keeping them going for so long. So there are lots of threats, I think, in this, but um, I'm sure there is going to be downward pressure on, on tuition fees across the piece, yes. and many institutions will think that online is a way of responding to that. Just one final note of clarification. You mentioned earlier badges. Mm -hmm. Could you explain what that term means. Yeah, the term badge originated in the, um, in the software industry. They're sometimes called Mozilla badges. And the, the concept is that for many skills these days, the best people to certify that you've got that skill is the community of practice that's using it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a particular software, who can say whether you're competent at using it? The software people who work in that area. So that's how it started. Mm -hmm. But it then took off um, to cover a whole wide range of things. Now it's uh, anyone, you or I, can offer a badge. And the credibility of the badge is related to the credibility of the person or institution offering it. You can also get endorsements of it, so that if it's, you know, Donald Fisher's badge, but you can get IBM to say, we think there's a very good badge for this purpose and so on. Um, so they're becoming more and more widely used for, and, and, they, and they will fit a whole variety of stuff. I mean, you can give a badge for a single lecture if you want, mm -hmm. uh, but the, you can give one for a whole degree. Some universities are giving them alongside their conventional courses as a kind of incentive to do various things or for some of the soft skills they'd like to teach and to give students a kind of you know, regular rewards as they go along, getting these badges rather than having to wait for the end of the term or whatever. So I think they're here to stay. Um, I mean, what's interesting about them, I should have said at the beginning, is that these are on the web and you collect a, a backpack of badges on your website mm -hmm. and they tell you far more about what the student did, how it was assessed and all the rest of it, than you would get in a normal university transcript. 
so there is all the detail you want about exactly what happened and therefore um, you know, as I say I think they, they are spreading I'm involved with my colleagues Tomenka in introducing them uh, to an organization in China which is an interesting sort of thing so I think um, they're coming in both to you know, conventional institutions and to other organizations um, for all kinds of purposes what their staying power is I really don't know but it seems to be they're an attractive addition to the framework of qualifications that, that we that we already have because essentially they stand or fall by the credibility of the organization offering them and any endorsements of employers that this has been useful. Mm -hmm. Well look I thank you very much for the interview.